Okay, guys, guess who's back in the market? Not like they ever left. We're talking jumbo loans, what they mean, what they are in the Sacramento real estate market and just in general. So you bring your questions, bring your notepads. Aaron and I have got the field tonight. Are you ready? Let's go. What is up, Sacramento real estate? Aaron, me, we're back talking a little real estate, interest, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, but before we get this started, let's talk a little bit about Elsa and Walter. We got them into contract. Awesome house. We're super excited. You guys, we love doing it and we're totally super excited okay. for it. Hopefully, we'll be getting Daniel and Sherry rocking sooner than later as well. Um, and it's great. So, Aaron, Jumbos. What are we talking about here? Jumbos. Well, I, you know, when you said you wanted to talk jumbos, I actually wore my my jumbo shirt today. But uh, jumbos, it's it's a, a unique segment of of the mortgage business, and and basically what we're talking about are really big loan amounts. And uh, you know, in previous shows, you you guys may have heard us talk about conforming loan limits, Fannie Mae loans, Freddie Mac stuff like that, and Basically, what, what we're talking about here is that each uh, agency, each conduit to, to basically get your mortgage completed, um, each agency has a, a loan limit set for each county within the, the continent of the United States. And so if, if you, know, you live in Sacramento County um, or are purchasing a home in Sacramento County, uh, there's a maximum loan amount that Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac will guarantee. Um, in in our market, in the, in the general region where we're talking to most people as the Sacramento region, and so we're always talking about Sacramento, Placer, El Dorado, maybe Yolo County. You know those those four counties. So in in our market, basically there's there's two loan limits. You've got five hundred and forty eight thousand two hundred and fifty dollars, meaning that if you borrow that much or less, you're what the, the government refers to as conforming. Um, if, if you go up to 598,000, you're still conforming, but they call you high balance and they charge you a slightly uh, higher premium to, to be a uh, high balance. But once you go over 598,000, so if you were to borrow 598 and $1, you're now what's, what's considered jumbo. Um, and so when you're a jumbo loan, whether you're a loan for 600000 or a loan for $3 million, um, basically that, those loans, they're, they're not guaranteed by the taxpayer. They're not guaranteed by the government, Fannie, Freddie, FHA, anything like that. And so they're, they're loans that some companies portfolio them, meaning that they, they write the loans, they come up with the guidelines themselves, and then they, they keep those loans on their, their books instead of like selling it to Fannie or Freddie. Um, and so what, what you'll see is that uh, these, these companies basically get to write their own guidelines. So you, you see some, some looser standards than, than what you might see in some conforming stuff. Um, but the the jumbo loans that I've been most excited about recently, because with COVID, just like most things, a lot of stuff disappeared during COVID. And so last year in March, when you know the pandemic hit and you know everybody you know started pivoting, um, the mortgage industry you know kind of had like a flashback to 2008 for a minute, and you know a lot of companies pulled back uh, the reins very tightly on their guidelines, some eliminated programs altogether. Um, and what we saw in the jumbo market was that jumbo loans all but kind of disappeared. The ones that were available, the, the pricing was just so far out that it, it just didn't, didn't make sense. Well, as you know, the world is, is coming you know, out of the fog that, that we've been in, um, over the last couple of months, we've also seen investors, mortgage investors, come back into the marketplace and they're hungry for jumbo, uh, hungry for jumbo product. And so we've actually seen um, 
uh, the re-entry of several really great jumbo loans that they're, they're so close to being just as good as a Fannie Mae loan or a Freddie Mac loan, like as far as pricing and all of those things, that really the only thing that, that sets them apart is just the, um, the loan amount. Um, I actually, uh, I've, I've got a few scenarios that I, that I put together just to give some examples real quick. But, you know, leading into, uh, into our call, I, I went ahead and I, I did some, some pricing scenarios. One of the things that's really cool with the jumbo loans as well is uh, right now they're they're allowing you to go up to they say eighty nine point nine nine percent loan to value so basically that's ten percent down ten point zero one percent down um, but the cool thing is that there's zero mortgage insurance um, and so what that means basically is they're they're baking that risk into the price into the rate but if you were to do like for example, a $1 million uh, purchase loan, and you only put 10% down, the rate right now, uh, if you if you did a 3.5%, uh, it only cost a half a point, and that's with no PMI. Um, really good good interest rate on, on, a, on a jumbo scenario like that. If you're gonna do like a traditional 20% down payment though, now you can get your, your loan all the way down into the high twos, just like you're able to do on those conforming, uh, you know, loan amounts. Um, let's see here. Uh, the other thing uh, we we're, we're you're mentioning some of uh, some of the clients that we've been working with. Uh, Jumbo goes beyond just, uh, you know, reaching beyond Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, VA um, has some great Jumbo options a while back. Uh, VA remove their loan limits. So they just, they don't have a loan limit. So if you're a veteran or active duty and uh, you have your full entitlement, which means basically that you don't have another VA loan and, or you didn't, uh, you know, go delinquent or have a, a, a bad debt with a VA loan. So you've got access to your full entitlement. There is no loan amount. As long as you qualify for the debt to income and the residual income ratios, you could borrow $3 million on a VA loan, 100% financing, no mortgage insurance, and get the same smoking hot interest rates that you're getting on a $500,000 VA loan or, or so on. Um, so with, with a jumbo loan, basically what it does is it, it extends the reach of your buying power. You know, if, if you, especially in our region, there's a lot of homes that are in a sales price that's beyond, you know, six, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars $900,000. And so if you're not in a position, like let's say you're buying a house for a million bucks and from a monthly payment standpoint, debt to income ratio standpoint, you could afford a $1 million mortgage, but in order to, to get your loan amount down to where you're a conforming like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac limit, remember I said in our area, you got to be at 598 max loan amount. So that'd right. mean that on a million dollar purchase, you'd have to come up with $402,000 for your down payment. So if you don't have the extra funds or, or if you have them and you don't want to put it towards real estate, um, a jumbo loan, basically allows you to keep more of your capital in your pocket working for you and you can make a smaller down payment um, while still you know obtaining the the home that you're looking for and the the exciting thing is with with the re-entry of several investors into the jumbo market there's more competition which means that you get better pricing uh, better service you know more product offerings all of that and so it's a, it's definitely a good time to, to, uh, get a jumbo loan. Nice. Okay. So Johnny has a question. Is it possible to get a jumbo loan with three to 5% down and no escrow account needed, or do you need at least 20% down? So right now the minimum, uh, unless Johnny, unless you're a veteran, if you're a veteran, then you could go zero down. Um, and, uh, and you wouldn't have uh, PMI. Now, if, if you're not a veteran, the lowest down payment option that's currently available is the 10% down on, on a jumbo. It's actually 10.01 because you, 
you can go to 89.99%. That's how much you can borrow versus the purchase price. Nice, nice. Yeah, I was actually, I submitted in for a uh, for a property in Anatolia with two amazing clients and we had a, a VA going too. And it, it, it did stink with the fact that we didn't get it, but we, you know, the the agent on the other end was kind of like you know I, I love the VA program but the owners were a little bit nervous that they wouldn't go through and and you know it it is kind of bad that that kind of stigma happens with a VA loan because it's an amazing product um, it's amazing just it, it, there's nothing there it's a great product and it's too bad that more people don't back it there's more it's just it's for me it just sucks you know what I mean without getting too out of control like uh, but it just it's not. You know, it's, I, it's too bad, you know. I agree with you. I'm a veteran myself. I have a VA loan. I, I used the VA loan to buy my house years ago. I, I think the VA loan is an awesome loan product. And unfortunately, uh, just like a lot of things, there's misinformation. And over the years, there's been a lot of misinformation uh, as far as how the VA loan works and misinformation communicated to to real estate agents, basically. And so the fear as a, as a real estate agent that, you know, is potentially, you know, helping this offer get accepted is that uh, with a VA loan, there's pest, uh, there's always a pest inspection. So there's no way of getting around that. Um, and so the fear is, you know, hey, we're going to have this pest inspection done. And then there's going to be pest work, meaning like they found termites or you know, something like that. And, and now there's going to be all this work that's needed to be completed in order for the transaction to close. Um, well, you know, for one, depending on your purchase price, especially if you're looking at, you know, like a million dollar jumbo or something like that. I mean, at, at a certain point, your price point's going to kind of eliminate the fear of, of there being pest issues, most likely. Um, yeah, I would assume a property condition for, for that price. Um, but the other thing to be cognizant of is even if there are repairs needed, it doesn't mean that the seller has to pay for those repairs. Um, on top of it, with VA loans, there are certain fees that the veteran is not allowed to pay. Um, they, they call them non-allowables. Well, in the past, and, and part of that miscommunication has been that, that the seller's got to pay it, basically. So if I'm a seller and I'm laying out these options, I'm like, well... I got this VA borrower and I got the pest, you know, uh, pest inspection I got to deal with potentially. And then also I got to pay some of their closing costs that I wouldn't have to pay for somebody else. Well, that's, that's not true. The seller doesn't have to pay it. It just means that the, the veteran can't pay it. And to be honest with you, what ends up happening is behind the scenes, the lender bakes it into the pricing and, and they don't, you know, the veteran doesn't end up paying it. So there's solutions. Um, you know, just like with our, our client, Mark, that we've got right now that's making offers with the VA loans, when you submit that offer, I'm actually calling the listing agent and saying, hey, I'm so-and-so, you got an offer from so-and-so, and it's a VA loan. Let me explain this to you so that, you know, you understand and there's no miscommunication on it. And um, I, I think that between that and maybe even throwing in, you know, the, although right now it's tough with just how competitive it is, but writing those letters, you know, where it, it conveys, you know, to the seller, you know, Hey, th this is our family, you know, we're going to, we're going to, you know, spend the rest of our lives here. And Oh, by the way, I'm a veteran and I serve my country and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Those kinds of things, you know, although money talks, we're all human and, and, you know, emotions play a role to a certain extent. So, you know, when you're hitting all those, those various things, you know, you never know what's going to, going to be the, the thing that pushes you over and, and get your offer accepted. Yeah. I mean, here, here's the thing for me, instead of just saying, thank you for your service, why don't you actually call the loan officer and see if it's realistic that a veteran can actually close a deal and make it happen. Um, you know, and like the house can do, I mean, you know, there's so many options, but like this program's awesome. VA loans, definitely have that stigma and they shouldn't. And for me, man, I'm batting a hundred with VA. So I'm good. You guys got them, bring them my way. I'm all good with that because I think it's a great program. And me as a realtor alone, I never shy away from that stuff. So now there's some realtors who do. In fact, okay, check this out. And I know we're going on a little tangent. 
super clients of mine. I don't want to put their name out there, but we were in con. They actually, this is good. They actually went and saw a house that um, another realtor had showed them, and she was like, "Yeah, you know, we're not. I'm not sure if they're getting accepted because our house needs work." We went in there, got it done, closed the deal, got them their house. They're super excited. All I'll say is that I'll see them at the next Greek festival. There you go. But it was good. It was good. So I'm good with that. So getting back to jumbos, another thing that's kind of interesting is. When I first started my illustrious real estate career, um, jumbos were crazy. They were just like one of those things where, like, you'd see, you know, you'd have clients qualifying for a jumbo or, you know, uh, one needing a jumbo loan now and again, right? It was like one of those things where it was like, oh, yeah, you know, I remember having those conversations where they're like, yeah, they might have to, you know, apply for a jumbo loan. And it was like a rare thing, you know, like once every three months, a client would be buying it over like, you know, 550. Oh my God, 550. And now it's like crazy because like almost anyone buying a house in Sacramento has, to, I mean, if they, it, it, they need to kind of, I mean, jumbos are basically something that everyone's dealing with now. And before it wasn't, I mean, now Sacramento's market is just nuts. I mean, and I always tell my clients too, I'm like, here's the thing, before you uh, jump into the market, look, just find a house you like, right? Go go and find a house you like, then go to Zillow and see the history of that house. That alone is going to tell you the skyrocketing prices of real estate. And it's true, like three years ago, a jumbo was like a rare thing. A like, oh my God, you know, I got a client who's looking for a jumbo loan. It's brutal. And now it's like, Jumbos, yeah, pretty much everyone's getting jumbos nowadays. Isn't that nuts? Just how much the market's doing? It it is it is pretty crazy. You know, things things do tend to pivot, right? You know, it's all all supply and demand. And when there's a need for something, somebody will will fill it. I you know, I I think one of the the best things about our current scenario with the jumbo loans, because you you you'd made me think of something, is you know, in the past, um, you're right. You know, with the jumbo loan, it was like, oh, we got to send this off to like this, you know, the the jumbo department or there's like a special, you know, person that that reviews these and there's special guidelines and it's, you know, it's a secret and all these kinds of things. Well, with with the reentry of all these different jumbo investors, um, one of the nice things about about it is basically so on a on a conventional loan. Like when when a customer applies for a loan, um, the mortgage company, when when they're determining what that person's approved for, if they're approved, um, the way it works these days, and it's been this way for for quite some time now, but it's it's all automated. There's literally there's a loan uh, operating program, a software program that that Fannie Mae has. Freddie Mac has their own. FHA, you know, they, there's all these different programs. And when we submit your application into the, the portal, um, it'll, we, we call them findings, but it'll basically spit out um, your findings and it'll say, you know, hey, this thing's approve eligible, um, provide these, these conditions. Or it'll say, you know, hey, refer, or, you know, it'll, it'll give decisions. Well, in the past, we didn't really have a way in, uh, from like a loan officer front end of, you know, working with the client. We didn't have a way to automate any of that. It was all you're basically manually figuring out. All right, Mr. Customer, this is what you're going to qualify for on the jumbo program based off of X, Y, Z. But then there, but then that was dependent upon me uh, remembering the specific guidelines and all the caveats for, for the, the program. Well, the way it's, it works right now is the lenders are basing it off of our DU findings. So we still, we just run the application through Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac's uh, system and, and we're, you know, we get an approve eligible, but instead now it just says improve ineligible. And the only reason it's ineligible is that the loan amount exceeds the county loan limit. And it makes it so simple for us on the lending side, because now we're just following our, our findings, just like we would on a Fannie Mae loan or a Freddie Mac loan. So it takes all the guesswork out of it. On top of it, it makes on, on the lender, on the underwriters uh, side of the transaction, it makes it way easier for them to underwrite the loan as well. So when it comes down to the speed of getting your file through the, the factory, um, it's much faster getting a jumbo loan today 
than it was say a year ago or, you know, a few years ago when, you know, these, these uh, guidelines didn't exist. So it's it's uh like like I said earlier it's it's definitely a good time to to be getting a jumbo loan if that's if that's what market you're in. Well, I think majority of people need to get one now. <laughs> I mean, if they're buying into this market. Yeah. All right. So Raj asked a question. Hey, Aaron, are wholesale lender rates really low right now with UWM versus Quicken the feud, or should we uh, go with our builder's lender for the lowest rate? Hit it. Yeah, the the feud between UWM and and Quick and that's that's funny, Raj. You're you're like staying up on, on everything. You, you got you got that. So uh, a few months ago, United Wholesale Mortgage. Just so the the rest of the, the folks know what's going on is United Wholesale Mortgage. They're the largest uh, wholesale mortgage company in the country. They're publicly traded. They uh, they they're the number one purchase lender uh, in the country as well. And uh, Quicken or Rocket Mortgage is, is what they've rebranded as. Um, they're in Detroit and UWM is in Pontiac, Michigan. So they're, you know, right across the, the river from each other. And there, there's a bit of a feud. And so a few months ago, UWM came out and basically they issued a, they call it their all in initiative. But what they said essentially was that Quicken um, is, uh, basically doing certain business practices that do not support the wholesale mortgage industry. Uh, they, you know, it's anti uh, mortgage broker essentially. And so what they did was they came out and said, Hey, if you work with Quicken, then you can't work with us. You can work with anybody you want, but you can't work with Quicken. And if, if you do work with Quicken, Hey, that's, that's fine. That's your choice. You just can't work with UWM. And, uh, for, for my company, for instance, when, when this came out, um, I laughed about it because I stopped using Quicken a long time ago, just because they're, they're not, um, efficient in terms of the machine behind the scenes. They're really good at making commercials and, and, you know, you know, selling. Um, but as far as the efficiency of the, the factory behind the scenes, it's nowhere near the same as, as UWM. UWM, it's like, you're, you, you're, you know, there's a 1980 Honda Civic, and then there's like a brand new Tesla Model S. UWM's that Tesla. I mean, they've, they've just got all the horns and whistles and speed versus some of the, the clunky things. So um, because of this feud, it has also caused, you know, they're fighting at each other, not just for market share on, on brokers, but also uh, doing so by lowering their prices. Um, and so I still have access to Quicken's pricing. And if, if you were to do a side-by-side -side comparison of Quicken and UWM, they're pretty much, they're, you know, on any given Sunday, they're, you know, within arm's reach of each other on pricing. Um, to answer your question, Raj, what's really going to dictate whether you get a better deal by going through a broker, whether they use Quicken or UWM, or going through uh, the builder directly, it's going to come down to that broker's business model. Um, and basically, uh, every every business has gets to set their own margins, the cost of what they charge the consumer. They also have control over their expenses, their overhead, you know, staff, all of those things. And so, what you'll find is that some companies. Um, they operate much more efficiently than others, and they're able to operate at a lower margin and still make a profit margin that, that keeps them in business that they can sustain off of. Other, other uh, models, you know, they may set their margin as, as high as they can get it. Um, so what, what I would suggest is that when, when shopping around, uh, find yourself, you know, we, we kind of refer to it as like a low margin uh, mortgage broker. But, um, you know, one of the one of the things that you might want to look at as well is working with a broker that actually originates like myself, uh, my, my partner and I, Jennifer and I, uh, she and I, we originate, meaning that we sell the loan like I'm the loan officer. She's the loan officer. Um, versus us having like an army of loan officers working for us 
and we take a little bit out of their commission. We don't have loan officers working here. So um, when you work directly with the broker, um, you've got less layers of, of expenses involved in it. So what we find a lot of times is we're able to offer a better deal than a lot of other mortgage brokers just because we don't have the same level of expenses. Um, but for you, Raj, I, I would suggest, you know, you, you basically uh, find yourself a low margin broker and then do your price comparison because the broker is going to have access to all lenders, regardless of uh, if they've chosen to work with Quicken or with with UWM. Hey, let, Aaron, let me ask you something. Let me just piggyback that question. One of the things that it does Quicken, what's up with Quicken's locking the rate? I heard that that was kind of one of the big issues as well with Quicken, or am I completely off? That they don't lock the rate. Like most lenders lock the rate, I guess, when you find the house, but Quicken doesn't lock the rate or something like that. Or am I completely off? No, that, I'm not I am a, a realtor, so I am allowed to screw this up. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're off on that one. Um, okay. it, what what a lot of uh, companies now you may be thinking of for a small period of time last year when when COVID hit, um, a lot of lenders, including Quicken, because I remember uh, talking to the rep specifically when this happened, is they stopped allowing what we call forward rate locks, meaning that um, I I lock my rate, but maybe I, I, uh, I haven't submitted my loan to underwriting yet. I've already identified the property, but I'm not necessarily like in the lender's assembly line. Well, okay. Quicken for a, a period of time and a bunch of other lenders, um, they just stopped allowing forward rate locks. And the reason for that was that at the time there was a whole bunch of market uncertainty. You know, all the all the lenders kind of had a flashback to 2008 and they're like, oh, my God, the sky's falling. We're all going to go out of business again. And for, you know, a, a period of maybe like 30 days or so, there were some almost like draconian pivots and, and you know, changes yeah. in our in our world. And then you know, everything immediately came back. It was, I, I think a lot of companies realized that they were very knee jerk um, and overreacted a bit. Um, but it was based off of the Armageddon from, you know, 11 years prior. Okay. Uh, but Quicken, uh, if you were to, uh, you know, if you were to register a loan with them today, and what that means is like as a, as a mortgage professional, we're, we've completed a loan application and we register your loan with the lender um, it basically makes it a real loan transaction. At that point, I could go and I could lock your rate right then. Okay, I um, like that. But uh, you know that that's pretty standard with uh, with most lenders being able to do a forward rate lock at this point. So people shouldn't be having a problem with that. So hey, quick in. I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. And I, I'm not I'm not a fan <laughs> of spaceship mortgage, so you didn't hurt my feelings. All right. Okay, our builder uh, lender is Loan Depot. They're willing to give us five thousand dollar cl closing cost credit, but I think UWM or a direct lender might have a better interest rate that covers a closing cost discount. What do you think, Eric? That you know, and that's just so Loan Depot should be able to provide you with a loan estimate, and that's basically it's a three page document. Pages uh, one and two have all the all the info that you're looking for, and specifically page two in the first box. So it's the top left box A. That's the lender's fees. All the other boxes are like title company, property taxes, all third parties. But the first box that's going to be your costs with Loan Depot. What what you'd want to do, Raj, is get a quote from somebody else whether it's a direct lender or a mortgage broker, or whoever, and um, compare their loan estimate to the loan estimate that you've got from Loan Depot. And then it, it should be, you know, things will stand out. Uh, you'll be able to see, all right, well, uh, obviously you can compare the difference in interest rates, but you'll also be able to see, well, is this lender charging points or do they have, some lenders charge junk fees or whatever, you know, admin fee, processing fee, you know, you can call a fee, all sorts of things. So depending on what the lender is, is charging you, ultimately they're all costs. So you add up your total costs and, and compare that to, uh, you know, the total costs of Loan Depot along with the rates. And it should be pretty easy to make an educated decision on what, what loan makes the most sense for you. Another quick way to do it as well, Raj, 
is just compare APRs, your annual percentage rate. Um, basically, whoever's got the higher APR has more costs. Yeah. It's so funny, Aaron, when you were, uh, Mateo was talking about uh, Honda Civic, mine still run. I was like thinking when you said that comparison, I'm like, I don't know, Hondas are pretty good. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, 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 just, I know. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. I, in my mind, I think it's because my mom had one. I imagine like the old sedan, it was like a tan colored one. But uh, no, no, no hating on the uh, on the Honda Civic. Why don't we change? Um, we'll change the Civic for a down Pinto. Payment. We'll change the C Civic for a Pinto, so it could. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, no, it's that's funny because I was thinking about that too. I'm like, Honda's actually pretty good. But okay, so um, how how's how's the market treating you right now, man? How's how's interest rates? How's the loan? Is it just crazy, or is it just crazy? Things are are crazy. I feel like it's it's that's just the norm in our business. So it's like we get a different kind of crazy, and as soon as as soon as you get used to that crazy, there's the new crazy. Um, you know, what I have noticed lately is that, uh, you know, as we're getting closer to the summer, as the, the temperatures heat up, as, you know, what kids were back in school, as some of those kids are getting back out and getting into their, their summer vacation or, or getting ready to, um, I'm, I'm noticing a lot more focus and, and a lot more people reaching back out that I talked to six months ago, nine months ago, a year ago or whatever. And they're, they're, you know, getting back into the buying mode. And so I think, you know, we've been talking about this a lot where, you know, as we get closer into the, the heat of the, the buying season, I think things are just going to get even crazier. Um, even, even though interest rates have, have ticked up a little bit historically from their lows back in August, rates are still really low. Um, yeah, yeah. We're still locking people in in the in the high twos on thirty year fixed rate money um, without having to you know make all these crazy uh, extra payments for discount points or you know the 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 tricky things you hear advertised where it sounds like it's a good rate but it's really an expensive rate. Um, you know things are are really good as far as borrowing costs go, um, and on top of that, uh, as far as lender bandwidth. Um, I'm also seeing that the glut of refinances that all these lenders have been living off of, um, that's starting to slow down a little bit. And so we're, we're seeing turn times pick up, meaning that they're able to, to you know, get to things faster, which is going to make it to where people can compete more in the purchase market because it's all about speed. Speed's the, the name of the game for us. Um, but it's a... Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, things are just going to keep heating up, you know, not to not to, uh, you know, be silly with it. But, you know, as 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 you know, we get closer into the summer, it's going to become much more competitive. Yeah, I know. I think so, too. I was actually um, I was actually with Jade, who just put a comment in her family. We were looking for possible custom home options, too, which is crazy, too. And I was like, oh, it was a crazy day. But Jade, I made it back for my live. I rushed home. I feel a little sunburned too. We were all over the place. We were taking out these cool lots and everything too. Um, but one thing actually that did happen when we were up there too, we were talking to a really experienced lender builder um, named Derek up in El Dorado Hills. And, and he was saying something that kind of like stuck in my head too. And this is like, you know, and this is for people who are kind of like, and this isn't anything for a pro and a con as far as anything. It's just throwing it out there. One of the things that he mentioned that I had never really touched on, but I did want to touch on here is the, the difference between Placer and Sacramento as far as COVID goes. And, you know, we were talking about it and he was mentioning, he's like, yeah, you know, Placer doesn't really listen to Sacramento too much about everything. Sacramento schools are locked down and stopped and all this kind of stuff where Placer schools just kept on going, doing their things. You know, in Placer, it's opened up more, no masks and everything. In Sacramento, it's still locked down. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole right and wrong and all this kind of stuff. I mean, whatever, it, you know, hey, look, it just is what it is. And people are going to definitely have their opinions. But I did find that being really interesting as far as when people move up here, whichever like appeals to them more. So just so people know out there and they're watching this, I'm, and I'm not going either way because honestly, that's not that's not what I do. But I will tell you though, Placer is a lot more open. Sacramento is a lot more locked down still. So 
this is kind of what as far as you should expect when you're coming up here. So don't be surprised if you're, you know, looking around Folsom for a home and then you switch gears and go over to like Rockland. It might be a little different thing. So just understand that that's kind of why. So Derek, my builder friend, you, you, you actually brought up a great point that I want to share with our audience and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, Jade and I had an interesting conversation too. And I was telling her the main reason I, I touched base with like Derek and a lot of the, you know, and I was, you know, working with or talking to a lot of the builders up there is because I was looking at Toll Brothers, I was looking at the new home company, and I was looking at JMC who's creating these million dollar homes. And, you know, like I will say, Toll Brothers is at a level of their own. But, um, you know, part of me came up with that idea. It's like, what, at what price point does a custom home become an option? And in my opinion, and I was talking to Jade about it, I'm like 1.4, 1.5. I think a custom home is exploring it and it's good, you know, and um, the process is interesting for a custom home. So if people are looking for custom homes, it's, you know, and you're looking around the Toll Brothers and, and the new home company, I'd say custom homes are definitely something to look into. At least, Give it a give it an option before you go that route. So that's all I'll say about that. Um, what else? What are you seeing for the summer as far as interest rates? Are we going to kind of stay on this little steady incline, little steady incline, or you know, it's, it's it's tough to say honestly. You know, I, everybody always wants the mortgage guy to predict the the interest rates. I you know, obviously, I I, I hope that they they stay low. Yeah. Um, you know what we what we have seen is that. Anytime the market, and when I, I say the market, I'm speaking just in general, when the market sees inflation setting in, like for instance, last week, there were two reports that came out that were very important, the consumer price index. Um, and and uh, both of these, these reports, they, they showed inflation, big time inflation numbers, especially on a month over month um, gain. And so when the market sees inflation setting in, um, that's when we see, you'll see the 10 year treasury bond shoot up and the mortgage bonds follow, tend to follow the 10 year treasury bond. It's not a, it's not a tit for tat. It's not a, an exact science, but typically mortgage backed securities, they trend uh, in the same direction that the 10 year uh, U.S. Treasury bills uh, trend in, and so as inflation continues to set in, I mean, dude, I was at Home Depot. I was telling you before we got on. You asked what I did all week, and I, I moved like seventy bags of of mulch into my backyard. And so when I was at Home Depot, I, I took a walk down the uh, down the lumber aisle just for for kicks, because on the end cap where they have the uh, four by eight sheets of particle board, you know, it's like sprayed like orange on one color. Yeah, I'm not yeah, sure yeah. why they do that. But I, I noticed that those sheets are 74 bucks a piece. I was like, is that for the whole pallet? No, that's for one piece. So I, I took a stroll down the, the lumber aisle and was just amazed at how much everything costs. And, you know, I know that that one's been, uh, you know, front and center for a lot of us, especially in the in the real estate world, is the cost of, of lumber. But if you look at the cost of just pretty much anything, um, whether it's it's gas or soda or, you know, whatever it is that you're buying, we're seeing costs increase. Um, Warren Buffett was uh, recently a couple of weeks ago uh, when they released their uh, annual letter to shareholders. Um, one of the things that he talked about and Warren Buffett's company, they own, I don't know, it's like some over a hundred different companies and they're in all different segments. They're, they own C's Candy, RC Willie, Geico Insurance. I mean, they're in multiple different industries and, and they were saying that um, they're seeing in all levels of their supply chain, they're seeing price increases. And so I think for us as, as consumers, as the year goes on, as our government continues to spend lots and lots of money, um, and as you know the world opens back up, I think that we're just going to continue to see price increases, and that will in turn um, cause mortgage rates to drive higher. At a, at a certain point, they they've just got to shoot up. Yeah. Um, which, if we're talking about the cost of waiting. Um, I was just talking to somebody earlier today um, and uh, she, she actually found us on this show and uh, we, we were talking about basically, you know, what it might look like 
a year from now, six months from now. And although we don't have any idea what, what those, what those things are going to look like, we can, you know, make calculations and say, you know, Hey, if rates were to, you know, move up 1%, this is how much it would cost. And what, what we were looking at in, in this person's situation was um, basically like, what would the, the cost of waiting be? And on a $500,000 loan amount, um, if, if you were borrowing $500,000 at 2.875% interest, um, your monthly payment was $2,074. That doesn't include taxes and insurance. Um, let's say that, that that same scenario, instead of 2875 was 3875 So we're only talking 1% increase in interest rate, okay? That same monthly payment of 2074 now you can only borrow $442,000, so I mean, in just with the one percent in rate change, that that scenario you lose a little over is almost sixty thousand dollars in buying power. Oof. Same cost, same you know, all all that. It's just that since the rate went up, the the you know the amount that you could borrow for that monthly uh, that monthly cost went down that by that much. So if if rates continue to rise. And if the supply and demand uh, issues that we face with with inventory continue, which I I, I just I don't see how it's going to change because it's not like anybody's building enough houses to to sustain our growth. Um, you know, kind of all signs point to home prices are going to continue to appreciate, or you know, even if they slow down a little bit, you know, I, I still feel like they're going to continue to to tick up. So I think that. For, for folks that are looking where they're like, hey, you know, should I buy now or should I wait a year from now or six months from now? Um, that, you know, you may, if, you're, if your reason for waiting is that you think you might get a better deal financially, that could be a poor decision. Now, if you're not, you know, if you're waiting because you're just not ready right now, you haven't saved enough up money or you're, you know, you, you're waiting for your next job or whatever, whatever having you wait, that's a different reason to, to hold back. But if it's if it's because you, you're holding out for a better deal, um, I, I keep saying this, but I, I think that uh, you'll be sorely mistaken at the end of the summer when you end up, you know, buying the same thing that you could have bought now, but instead of getting it for the you know two something rate, you're getting it at three and a half or four or something like that. Plus, you're having to pay a little bit more for the house. Um, Aaron, when it goes to, when it hits ones, give me a call. I'm buying. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they're giving I'll, it away. I know, huh? I'll get right on that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> might, might be a while though. <laughs> What's your number? Yeah, I mean, it is crazy. I mean, those who wait, even right now, if you look at the, the way this year has gone, I mean, people who waited are losing, right? I mean, like at the beginning of this year, you got in in the twos. Now you're, if you're lucky, twos, threes, whatever. I mean, that's the thing. And I think people are, it's like anything else. It's like human nature. They're like, no, 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 it'll come back. I'll get that. But I mean, there's a point of the, there's, there's a point where you have to say to yourself, I, I want to get at least this, not like I'm going to wait to get that because Bob, the neighbor got that and he's super excited. So I'm going to wait till that happens again. Like I said, in my, in my gut, and I tell people this all the time, I think it is eventually something's going to, something's got to give in this market. I mean, prices are getting too high. Inventory, I do see all of a sudden a little bit, I think maybe a lot of people are getting a little discouraged with the new home builders out there right now. So a lot, of, I'm getting a little bit more, more kind of um, switching gears from people who are saying new homes, new homes, new homes. Yeah, let's see some pre-owned homes. So I see that happening as well. So it's kind of interesting. Okay, Raj has a question. Any thought on online lenders like Guaranteed Rate or SoFi? Do they have the best rates because of the low operating cost? Uh. So as far as online lenders go, especially in a purchase transaction, you know, one of the things that you got to consider is what are you giving up for the lower interest rate? And, and when you're talking lower interest rate, sometimes you're only talking, you know, one tenth of a, of a percent um, or even less in terms of like how much better of a, of a deal can you get somewhere else? And although I, I get that every penny counts and, and all of that, and everybody wants to get the best deal, but one of the things that 
uh, when it comes down to it is that a lot of these online lenders, you're not working with a very experienced loan officer. If you look at their license ID number, it's probably in the millions. Um, you know, they if you look at their work history, they probably just got in the mortgage industry last year during the boom. Um, there's a lot of different things like that. On top of it, um, typically the online lenders, good luck getting a hold of them nights and weekends when you're out shopping for houses and need your pre-approval letter updated or quotes on what that scenario looks like. And so what I, what I would say is that it is possible, depending on your scenario, to get a better deal going with an online lender. Sometimes. Um, that being said, you may not get the same. Well, you I will say you're not going to get the same level of service or expertise that you can get from somebody that's local, that's been in the business for a long time, that understands the market. Um, like you, you mentioned Guaranteed Rate. They're a great company. They recently bought Owning which is that online lender from SoCal that has all the annoying commercials. You know, I just crushed it with by switching to owning or whatever. But if you were to call owning, we actually get a lot of uh, at least once a month, my brokerage, we close a transaction for somebody that tried refinancing or going to them for a purchase. But those lenders are cherry picking all the easy transactions. So if you don't fall under the bucket of like getting an appraisal waiver, being full document, certain percentage of down payment, you know, all these these different things that make you a very easy file to, to push through the factory. They just don't they don't do those loans. Um, and so depending on your scenario, Raj, who knows the online lender that 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 could be a good call for you. I definitely would stay away from uh, the second one that you mentioned. They're kind of a let's try and be lending in every segment of, of lending instead of specializing in, in one thing, which is what you're trying to get a mortgage. Um, so if you were going to go with an online lender, I'd, I'd, I'd look, you know, with the first one you suggested or there's a, another company called Better.com. They're known for, you know, for having great pricing. But they're also known for they don't they're not very good with calling people back. Um, you know, it, it, they're based out of New York. So when you, you know, submit your offer potentially, which I don't know, Raj, I can't remember if you're if you're already in contract on a new build, and maybe that doesn't matter, or if you're you're out in the market competing. Um, if you're out in the market competing, and Mark, you know, can answer this better than I, but I know from my experience, what I always hear listing agents, real estate agents say is that when they get a pre-approval letter from Xanadu funding and they're, you know, it's some online company that they're, you know, it's either not local or they're not familiar with, they're not as likely to say, hey, this is a good offer. Um, a lot of times you'll even hear those, those agents say, hey, you need to go get pre-approved with so-and-so because we know that uh, they're, you know, a local company. And if they say they'll get the loan done, they'll get the loan done. So yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd vet out all, all, uh, you know, parts of, of what you're getting besides just the interest rate. Yeah, no, I definitely, I mean, I, for me straight up, whenever I submit one of the questions, the listing editor always says is, Hey, is it a local lender? Do I know them? Did, uh, and then, then you got some realtors, of course, are going to tell you, like, if you get pre, you know, you got to go through my lender for me to accept the offer which it, it's not really a good thing, but you know, whatever it is, you know, the market is crazy and, you know, but it is what it is. But local lenders always tend to be, cause you know, you have a track record for them. The company is a track record and all that stuff. It's, Sacramento might be, there might be a ton of realtors, ton of mortgage professionals here, but truth of the matter is it's a very small bubble and everyone kind of knows each other. It's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Everyone kind of knows each other and that's just kind of how we work. All right. Hi, I'm waiting to cash out my crypto to buy. You know, okay, that's actually a very interesting thing. Now that like, okay, because so I I have Bitcoin, I have what's called Ethereum. 
Um, so I, I, I have a lot of the, the crypto stuff. And like for me, it's dipped, right? And I was talking to my uh, financial advisor, Michael. <laughs> we were talking about it and he's like, yeah, you know, and I was thinking to myself, you know, maybe it's a time to cash out and start buying properties. Because right now, if you can get your hand on a couple of these investment properties, rent them out and stuff, it's, it's a good way to go. So I would also say to yourself as the ROI, like what are you looking at? Like right now, I do think that if you can get yourself a deal for an investment property in Sacramento, I don't know necessarily. I mean, maybe the first couple do flips to get your money and your income kind of like, you know, to get you some cash in the game. But getting some of these little investment properties that you can rent out. I mean, a lot of people who are buying in Sacramento right now who are out of, out of you know, out of state or out of, you know, city, whatever, coming in. I mean, go to Craigslist, see the rental prices. I mean, they match pretty much mortgage prices on buying the place, or if not higher. I mean, the rental market here is just crazy. And if you haven't, if you haven't looked on just, just Craigslist, to see what people are renting for around here. It's absolutely crazy. So, I mean, hey, I get it, crypto. I totally get it, but I don't know. I don't know. Renting. Like buying just just wait. You know, you got to wait. You got to time it right to where Elon Musk has just made a, a tweet or a comment about the crypto that you're holding or not holding so that, you know, you, you can time the market right. Otherwise, you're going to, you know, I feel bad for some of the dog coin investors at, at certain points. <laughs> I know. Well, or I was wondering if Elon maybe made that statement after he left the Joe Rogan po podcast. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? All right. So we got this. I heard the buyer sentiment has dropped to a 10-year low recently because of low inventory and bidding wars. What do you guys think 2022 will look in terms of interest rates, inventory, and demand? Yeah, buyer sentiment is horrible. I mean, here's the thing, though. I will tell you one thing, though. Um, Buyers are more um, are more are okay with hearing. They're, they expect it to be a horrible market when they jump in. Like six months ago, you know, you know, when someone would call up and wanted to buy, I'd kind of have to sit them down, talk to them, and they'd look at me and go, "Like this guy is not, you know, this is this." You, it's not that bad. And then they get out there and then they realize how bad it is. Now it's not as much like that. I mean, people are kind of, you know, expect it to expect it. I mean, it is kind of brutal. Like I said, it does. It's like, you know, it's like Vegas heat, right? You get out of the taxi cab and it hits you in the face. It's kind of like that in Sacramento, especially. I mean, you know, you can't expect it to make sense. Like if that's a, if that's what you're trying to do in this market, or I have some clients who, who, who are telling me, you know what, we want to sell our house high and we want to buy low. And I'm like, this is not the market for that. You know, <laughs> you're going to make your money selling your house and then you're going to probably give it away when you try buying a house, if not more. It's just that market. And sentiment's down. I mean, buyers are really kind of bummed out. A lot of people are passing on even summer and just saying, you know, I'm just going to wait it out. And whether that's a good idea, bad idea, they don't really care. They're just like, I'm just not dealing with this stuff. And, and I do get it, you know, and I, you know, part of me thinks that the market could be better towards the end of this year, even though interest rates could be higher. I do think, I do see inventory starting to get a little bit better mm -hmm. in the market. I think it's still getting gobbled up because we got summer rush. We have a lot of people that have been waiting to buy um, I think people are throwing out insane offers. Like I was, uh, I was in a bidding war for a house in Gold River that was listed for what was it? And I have actually video that I'll be showing on Wednesday in this house because it was pretty beautiful. I think it went it was listed for seven eighty eight, and um, my client was like, "Okay, you know, I want to put an offer for it." So I talked to the listing agent. And she's like, "Yeah, you know, everyone's in the eights already." And then I called her back, you know, a couple hours later. I'm like, how are we doing yet? And she's like, okay, look, I'm going to be straight with you, right? We got a bunch of people. And this is a property listed at seven, I think it was 788 or 85 or something like that. And she's like, I'll be honest with you. We got a lot of people right now that are in the eights, probably mid eights, you know, we're there. Then we got this one offer, all cash, 925, quick close. I mean, we're talking like, possibly close to like $75,000 over the even lowest offer. They weren't even saying, Hey, you know, what's it going to, you know, what's it going to take to beat it? They're like 925. We know we're overpaying by maybe a hundred thousand dollars. We don't care. We want the house. We don't want to deal with the bidding wars. We're good with it. And they threw in that offer. They got the house 100%. But I mean, did they overpay for the house? In my opinion, 100%. They probably overpaid like $75,000. They didn't care. Now that is a client that I kid you not. I don't know them but they're the client who probably just got beat out for a house a couple of times. 
And they're at the point where they say, look, we don't care what it takes. We don't want to deal with the bidding war. We just want a house. So those are the people now that people coming into summer are probably going to compete against. The ones who are like, we just want a house. You know, we don't care what we have to pay. We've already been like through the wars and, you know, we've been dealing with the appraisal contingency. We don't care. We're not putting an appraisal. We don't want the loan contingency. We're good with waiving that. We don't want the inspection contingency. We don't want to waive that. And how much is this house worth? Oh, 785. Okay. What's the appraised value? Oh, probably 870. Put 925 in. Those are the people that you're going to have to compete against. So honestly, Heck yeah, buyer sentiment's probably at an all-time low. I'd be bummed out too. Imagine this. You're looking at something. You know you're going to overpay for it, but then there's someone who's not only going to overpay for it, he's going to over, 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 overpay for it. I mean, like, that's nuts. You know, so yeah, that's who you're going to have to deal with. And yeah, buyer sentiment is is crazy. As far as, as, far as 2022, I mean, I do think that eventually inventory is going to slowly come back into the market slowly, but we're going to just see all of a sudden, it's going to be one of those things where we all of a sudden will see it and it'll be somewhat back to normal, you know? So I do think inventory is going to come back probably close to end of this year, beginning of next year. I think inventory is going to be manageable. Will it be back to what it was? Probably not just yet, but I think we're going to see a lot more inventory on the market. I think interest rates rising will help kind of settle it down a little bit. I think um, I think the thing is, I think people probably will start towards the end of this year, maybe shifting a little bit from the new home builders just because new home builders are increasing the prices so much that appraisals mm-hmm. are becoming a big issue. Um, and that's just my own two cents. I think uh, new home builders are like trying to catch their breath. I mean, they've been, check this out, Aaron. This is interesting. They, I actually went to Richmond American and I was talking to a buddy of mine who works there, Toby. And I was like, what's going on now? He's like, yeah, we're delayed by like, you know, or a lot of people are delayed for a month. I'm like, why? He's like, well, a majority of the paint that we get comes from India. And because the canal was blocked out, paint hasn't been able to exit. So majority of builders are like a month out because of paint. So weird things like that are happening. Window shortages, like you said, lumber prices. So I think people for the new homes are going to get a little frustrated. Like, you know, I think pre-owned, I'm seeing a lot, like I said, a lot of people are switching gears again. You know, people who are like pre-owned, pre-owned, bidding wars, I'm not dealing with this. Let's go new home. (laughs) Now new homes are just frustrating. And it's like I said, it's nothing against the salespeople there. They can only go at the speed the builder can build. But I do think that that now pre-owned is becoming something that's back on the chart because people want their house sooner, not like 2028, they'll get their house. So I think uh-huh. people are saying, you know, screw this, let's go pre-owned. Let's see what we can do. So they're jumping back into the market. Um, and so that's what I'm seeing, at least. 2022, I think it's going to be interesting. I think it'll be lighter than this year. I think it'll be a more manageable market in 2022. What do you think, Aaron? I, I agree with you. And I, I, I think, you know, if you're just pick one reason why it's going to be different is that interest rates will be higher. Um, short of there being, you know, a, a new pandemic or, you know, some, some you know, large scale economic you know, event that would cause, uh, you know, rates to drop like it, it did last year, which, you know, I, I just don't see any, anything like that. Um, short of something like that, we are going to see rates tick up. If you, if you just like compare it to from 2016 to 2020, um, when, when Trump got into office, we had just finished a three year, uh, bull run on, on mortgage interest rates. Um, you know, from 2013 to 2016, there was a, a little bit of a like a refinance boom. Rates had dropped down to the threes for the first time in ever. And, you know, everybody was really excited about it. And uh, as as the new administration got in and got their various initiatives going and, and whatnot, um, and the world, you know, our economy starts catching up with with those policies and, and, and initiatives. We started seeing inflation and we started seeing rates tick up. And before Trump left office, a good interest rate on a 30 year fixed rate mortgage was in the fours. So, you know, if if if, you know, things just slowly uh, tick up like they have in the past, which I don't really see any reason why they they would not, um, it's it's going to reduce people's buying power. So that means, you know, the, the you're going to have less people to compete with 
But at the same time, it also means that you potentially, you too have less buying power. So you might not be able to compete as much as you were before. Everybody's individual situation is gonna, gonna differ, but um, it'll definitely take some people out of the market, especially those that are on the low end of the market. Like if, you know, if I've got somebody right now that's like pre-approved for $400,000, um, that's that's pretty much like the entry level, you know, un unless you're getting a small condo or, you know, there, there's some areas where you, where you can, you know, get in in the, the threes. And uh, but for the most part, I mean, a, a decent, you know, starter is going to be somewhere around that 400,000. So if you just look at those people, for instance, that are going to be in that price bracket, well, let's say rates are a point higher or two points higher than where they are right now, which is totally feasible um, based off of where we've we've been in the not too distant past. Um, those people now, they, they were able to afford 400,000. Well, now maybe it's 350 or 300. And just because rates have ticked up, that doesn't mean that uh, purchase, uh, I'm sorry, uh, appraised values have dropped. So uh, I think you'll have less people in the market along with, you know, all of us between getting vaccinated and just time going on and everybody, you know, being sick of being cooped up or whatever, you're going to, you're going to have a lot more people willing to move, willing to sell, willing to deal with people coming through their house for, you know, viewings, all of those things. So the, the more we get towards that normalcy, um, you know, you're going to, you're going to have uh, more inventory coming onto the market and potentially less buyers able to afford that inventory because of higher interest rates. Yeah. I mean, the thing, the problem I see us coming, bumping into too in the future is the fact that when the market starts to settle a little bit and house prices, probably they'll probably dip a little bit. I mean, they're just, you know, natural how they probably will just a little, but it's going to be crazy when sellers uh, are going to be, you know, so used to these like crazy, like bidding wars and everything. And once kind of everything kind of starts to settle down a little bit, it's gonna be interesting how everyone somewhat kind of gets gets kind of used to the idea that maybe they can't sell their house for as much as they did three months ago. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting because then the comps are gonna be around. I don't know. It's gonna be a nuts market. Either way, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to be in real estate right now. I mean, it just is. I mean, it's a nuts market, but I do think I do think sellers. Are might be a little surprised what they get can get through their house later this year, as opposed to putting on the market right now and getting top dollar. Yeah, uh, right. Right think? now, you got to offer to you know put the seller's kids through college. You know, in a few months from now, they may have to offer to put your kids through college, depending on you know what what the what the market dictates. So it's uh, right. things things change on a dime. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Hey Raj, we got to talk Bitcoin when I see you next. <laughs> All right. So awesome response. Yeah, no worries, Adam. We're always here for you. Um, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, the market is still nuts. Um, you know, a lot of people are still like who waited till summer are like jumping in right now. Um, and it just is a crazy market. Like, like I said, if you're thinking about jumping in there, Aaron's a guy that I run deals with. He's awesome. He's local and he'll hook you up and take care of you answering your questions you've got. Um, and if you are jumping in, just reach out to our team. We'll, we'll give you a little bit of a briefing. We always do Zoom calls, so you'll get to, a little bit of FaceTime, so we get to talk and figure out exactly what you're looking for. Because truthfully, one of the things that pissed me off more than anything about this market specifically is the fact that a lot of uh, realtors, a lot of mortgage brokers have grabbed the customer service and thrown it out the window. And they do not take the time for their clients. Now, I get it. It is a tough market and everyone's running around like crazy, but this is kind of why I come live right now. I got Aaron too, is because we can field your questions. We can answer anything you got right here. And if it needs to go to a stage two where we're meeting on Zoom and we're talking a little bit about your situation, we got your back. We'll make the time for you. And like I said, buying a home shouldn't be as stressful as it is in this market. We can't promise that we'll take out the stress completely, but we will do our best to be there if you have issues, problems, questions, because this is a huge investment and you need people who are actually willing to pick up the phone, answer the text at the end of the day. Oh, yeah. all right. All right, Aaron, let's talk numbers. Keep in mind, I can only count to three. <laughs> nice. Dude, that is so Monday, end of the day humor. I love it. Seriously, though, I'll reach out to connect and see if we can work something out. Very right. cool. 
And like I said, one of the coolest things about Aaron too is like he's low sell. And you know, you don't want to get one of those schlocky guys who are like, you know, oh, I'll get him best. It, there's too many of those out there. And um, that's it, guys. We'll be here next Monday, 5 30, same bat channel, same bat time. And at 5.30 on Wednesday, I will be coming live. Jacob might be here. He might not be. I think he's going to Puerto Vallarta. Ooh, boo-hoo. Sad, wow. sad time for him. Um, I'll be hitting the best new home deals under $500,000 in the Sacramento, Placer, El Dorado, Yolo counties. So if you're still thinking new and you're thinking, I ain't paying over $500,000, I'll have good options for you on Wednesday. We'll talk. We'll take a little bit more of a sneak peek on the pocket. If Jacob's around, I know that's one of his favorite spots. And guys, until next time, this is Sacramento. How's that sign off? Is that pretty good? It's awesome. All right, guys. Until next time, next week, we will see you. This is Sacramento Real Estate. Take care.